Hello, quarantine students, and welcome to day six of distance learning. Uh, today, we are going to start uh, by looking at um, ways to identify minerals. So let's begin. All right, so we have now looked at the four different rules for what it takes to be a mineral. So we now we know what a mineral is, but we need to start telling them apart. There are over 2,000 minerals, so we need a way to identify uh, each one from each other because every one of them is unique. Um, basically, what happens is uh, something is being uh, dug up somewhere, or ground is being excavated or uh, to, to uh, plant, uh, to build something. Somebody comes across a mineral and they will go to a geologist and say, hey, what is this? Um, mostly in the, in the uh, regards for safety, but um, yeah, geologists have to be able to um, tell one mineral apart. And we're to do that, we are gonna uh, look at the physical properties that are gonna give us clues. Now there is no one piece of information that's gonna, um, a geologist can use to identify a mineral because a lot of minerals have things in common with other minerals, but no two minerals out of the 2000 uh, have everything the same. Otherwise, they'd be the same. So geologists and, well, sixth grade students <laughs> need to use several uh, clues about a mineral to narrow down the possibilities. So when a geologist is, be, is presented with something, uh, they're going to start off with uh, that mineral possibly being over 2,000 uh, possibilities. So one piece of information is only going to narrow it down to just a couple of hundred. Two pieces of information is going to narrow it down to maybe less than a hundred. Three pieces of information is going to narrow it down to maybe like 50. Four pieces of information has got it down to the teens. And then after five or six pieces of information, we may have enough to tell what a mineral is. So each piece of information that we gather is going to eliminate a possibility. Um, so instead of I, using a, a piece of information to uh, figure out what something could be, it's more of a game of figuring out what it's not. So every piece of information that we find eliminates possibilities. Now, this is going to be very similar to a game, board game, that many sixth graders have played. Um, what game can you think of where you start off with all the possibilities and then you ask questions and then with each question you eliminate possibilities until you're down to just one? That game most of you have played is like Guess Who. So in the board game Guess Who, you start off with all the possibilities you ask questions and those questions begin to narrow down the possibilities until you're down to just one possible thing it's going to be. Well, identifying minerals is going to be just like that. So the first clue uh, that um, scientists, uh, geologists will start off with is the physical property of hardness. Um, hardness is a measurement of how easily a mineral is scratched. Um, how easily it is cut by various substances, how well it can turn around and cut other things. Um, so uh, we can use this to um, uh, kind of figure out in what range of hardness a substance is going to be, and that's going to narrow down a lot of possibilities right away. The guy who figured this out was a, a scientist by the name of Frederick Mose, and um, he developed the Mohs scale of hardness. He wanted substances that were uh, accessible to geologists all over the world. So he didn't want to pick anything really too rare, but he wanted a, um, a set of minerals that could be used to identify the relative hardness of a mineral. So he ranked all minerals on a scale from one to 10. One is the softest that's out there, and anything, any mineral that is a one is very, very easily scratched. It's scratched by just about every other mineral out there. Um, 
it is terrible for using as a cutting instrument. Um, the 10 is the hardest. There's only one 10 out there. And it, uh, the, there is nothing that will scratch it except for that substance. A substance can scratch itself. So at the very bottom uh, of the most scale of hardness is the mineral talc. Um, this is a very hard, uh, big block. I mean, it's a solid. Uh, somebody, you know, were to pick this up and throw it at you, well, it, it would hurt. But this mineral is very, very easy to cut and scratch. You could actually take your fingernail and start scratching away at this and create a big pile of powder. Uh, you can carve your initials uh, into a, a big block of talc. Talc is so soft that we actually use it as the main ingredient in baby powder. Uh, if you get a bottle of baby powder, it'll say talc or talcum powder as the ingredient, and then maybe some fragrance to make it smell nice. But this is a very, very soft mineral, and so Mose put it at the bottom of one. Now, this scary, sharp, pointy-looking thing is actually absolutely terrible at cutting because it's only a two on most scale of hardness. Gypsum um, is a very common mineral. It's found all over the world, and uh, it can be used uh, for a variety of products, but none of which would be good for cutting much of anything. Uh, this, again, is soft enough to be scratched by your fingernail. Now, speaking of fingernails, if your fingernails uh, were on the most scale of hardness, they would be a 2.5. They are not officially on the most scale of hardness though, uh, because well, they're from an organism. Uh, they are organic and minerals, if you remember, need to be inorganic. So you will not find um, fingernails being listed as a mineral, but if they were, just to kind of give you an idea of uh, the, what worth minerals are, they would be about a 2.5. Copper actually is a very soft metal. Um, it is and soft by um, in terms of being able to cut. Cop, you don't see copper knives out there. They're, there's they're, um, they would be terrible at cutting much of anything. Um, I mean, a, a big block of copper would hurt again if it was thrown at you. But um, as far as actual cutting, copper is actually really terrible. So it's uh, only a two point five to three. So you could almost scratch um, a, a piece of copper with your fingernail. The mineral calcite, it comes in at number three. And calcite, as you can see, has a lovely uh, cubic crystal structure. Uh, calcite is very common. You'll see it um, actually in a lot of uh, water here in Cincinnati. Uh, calcite is a, a mineral that dissolves easily in water. And uh, you'll see it like in uh, bathtubs and sinks and things like that is that mineral that gets left behind. Uh, when water evaporates. Fluorite, uh, besides being pretty, comes in at a number four. It's very common around the world. And an iron nail, which again is not naturally occurring, so who wouldn't be a uh, mineral, but um, iron itself is at about a 4.5. So it's actually, for being uh, very strong and sturdy, is very easily scratched and cut. All right. The mineral apatite, which as you can see, has sort of a hexagonal uh, crystal structure. Um, the mineral apatite um, is kind of common around the world, which is why Mose put it there. Uh, they're at number five. It's actually about halfway up. So about half the minerals out there will scratch apatite and apatite, apatite will scratch the other half. All right. Glass is not a mineral. Okay. Um, the main reason why is that it has a amorphous crystal structure. Uh, glass itself can be naturally occurring, but it has, does not have an organized uh, uh, arrangement of atoms, an orderly arrangement of atoms. So uh, there is naturally occurring glass. There's like volcanic glass and beach glass from lightning strikes and things like that. But I, I threw it on here just to kind of give you an idea of... Um, uh, it's relative hardness. It's a common product around us. Um, glass, uh, because it's a 5.5, would actually cut an iron nail, and you could not take an iron nail and cut glass. Now, here we have to make a distinguish uh, distinguishment between scratchability, which is what hardness is about, 
and smashability. I could definitely break an eye, uh, a piece of glass with an iron nail, but I can't scratch or cut uh, a piece of glass um, with an iron nail. Um, feldspar is ridiculously common. Uh, it's, a, it's a very uh, common rock forming mineral. Uh, it's starting to get up there on most scale. It is a six. Steel is a uh, human made product. Um, steel does not occur naturally. Uh, so steel is not a mineral, but um, it is something uh, that is in our lives. So most of our knives, uh, cutting knives, butcher knives, um, your steak knives, whatever, these are made out of steel. And so I wanted to give you an idea of uh, what steel's hardness was. So steel is about a 6.5 um, on uh, most scale of hardness. Number seven is quartz, a ridiculously common mineral found all over the world. Uh, quartz has uh, a pretty good ability to cut most things, and it is a uh, seven on most scale of hardness. We, uh, if we ever see you, <laughs> we'll be using streak plates in our labs. Um, streaks, uh, streak plates are made out of porcelain, so um, any unglazed porcelain is, is actually a seven. A lot of uh, dinner plates are made out of porcelain, the ma uh, which is the same substance as a streak plate. And that is why your knives don't really scratch or cut your dinner plate. It, your dinner plates have been made out of a substance that needs to be harder um, on most scale of hardness than, a, than the knives, which are of a 6.5. So um, otherwise, every time you cut your food, you would also be cutting the plate, and that's not a very good plate. So um, plates and other substances that knives don't scratch are uh, often made out of porcelain. Topaz. Um, this is a very, very good example of why we never, ever use color to identify minerals. Uh, throughout this week, you are going to see a lot of different properties of minerals and we never ever use color. Topaz is an excellent example of how one mineral can come in a wide variety of colors. Uh, going back to last week's lesson, the orderly arrangement of atoms and definite crystal structure, sometimes impurities are trapped inside and the dip, what uh, different impurity there is will kind of shift its color uh, from one way to another as the uh, electromagnetic light waves uh, pass through it. So we never ever use color to identify a mineral. Um, you'll see it mentioned in your book, but we never actually use it uh, uh, to identify because it's just, as you can see here, it just is not helpful. <laughs> um, minerals can come in a wide variety of colors, so color isn't really that useful. Topaz, a uh, very popular gemstone, I believe uh, if you're born in November, this is your birthstone. Uh, anyway, it's an eight. Corundum is what minerals uh, is the mineral that rubies and sapphires are made out of. Um, again, uh, it really comes down to what impurities are trapped inside and will kind of shift the way light travels through it. And so corundum can either be uh, red or blue. So a, technically speaking, a ruby and a sapphire are the same mineral. They're the same substance. And then finally, at the very top is the diamond. Uh, diamond is a 10. The only thing that can scratch a diamond is another diamond, um, at least as far as a physical substance. We have other ways of cutting um, diamonds uh, with like lasers and water pressure and things like that. But um, all of these angles that were cut onto this gemstone were cut using other diamonds. Um, it's the only thing that can actually cut a diamond. Now, again, just to go back to the difference between scratchability and smashability, I can take a hammer, which would be made out of steel, which would only be about a 6.5, and I can definitely smash a diamond, but that's not cutting a diamond. Please remember that hard, the physical property of hardness is just about cutting and scratching. It's not about how sturdy or uh, strong a substance is. Um, or how durable it is. It's just all about cutting and scratching. All right. So when a um, uh, geologist is given a mineral, he will actually get out Mohs kits. I have Mohs kits in my room. I was going to show you. <laughs> but um, so you get a mineral 
and somebody says, what's this? Well, the first thing a geologist will do is they'll go to talc and they'll take their mineral and they'll try to scratch talc. And if it scratches talc, the scientist knows that it is harder than a one. And then the scientist will start to scratch gypsum. And if it does scratch gypsum, we know that that substance is at least a two. And then the scientist will scratch it on calcite and it'll scratch calcite and it'll scratch it on fluorite and it will scratch fluorite and then it will scratch it on apatite and then that's where it stops scratching. And apatite, if you turn around and use apatite to scratch your mystery substance and it does, now you have a good idea of a uh, what range your mineral is. It's harder than a four but not as hard as a five, so it's somewhere in between four and five. And that's all we know, is that it is in between a four and a five. After that, you can get out smaller kits that, can get, that, that are like 4.1, 4.2, 4.3, things like that. But just knowing that your mineral is somewhere between a four and a five on most scale of hardness, that can eliminate uh, over a thousand possible uh, minerals out there. And your big game of guess who get has now become a lot more manageable. Um, so one property won't tell us what a mineral is, but it can be one clue to finding what a mineral is. All right. So that was a big, long lesson because there's a lot to talk about. There are still no book work. Don't ask me about book work. Uh, for any of the questions about this activity, please, 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 please go back, rewatch, and listen or read. I'm not going to be sneaky about anything. And bye-bye.